So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk. I think it's absolutely fantastic. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, um, a trauma surgeon from Liverpool. We're very closely with Mark and the team of the uh, the uh, TIG at the Public Health Institute. Um, and I've been asked to come and talk about the Trauma Prevention Foundation, which is a, um, a model of collaborative working. So, sorry, if that slide went up, I should have said, I know, I can see the wincing at the back already. <laughs> Basically, there are some clinical slides here. They're not too bad, but those of a nervous disposition probably ought to leave. So, the, there's a significant proportion of trauma that's preventable. And, I mean, this is an 18 year old patient of ours um, from last year. He had a penetrating injury to behind his right orbit. Um, the blade was left in situ, and this was very much a preventable, life threatening injury. And it's these preventable, life threatening injuries that the preventability of them that we want to untangle, we want to understand, and we want to, uh, to, to answer, basically. So what, what actually is the problem with trauma? <clears throat> so it's still the commonest form, a cause of death in the United Kingdom for, for our younger generations, for our younger demographic, and it continues to be the case. For every death, and that's for, for males and for females, and for every death that's recorded, there are uh, quantified there are two people who have uh, um, a life-changing permanent disability. So it's a massive problem, it's, it's still there. Um, but it's, it's changing in terms of the face of major trauma, the, 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 the demographic of, of the patients that we're treating in the major trauma centre, it's, it's got about two decades older, back in the 1990s, um, it used to be the, the, the 20s, 30s, that, um, the medium age nowadays is your um, late 40s, early 50s. Also the mechanism of injury, back in the 1990s around 60% were due to drug traffic collisions and only five, less than 5% due to falls less than 2 metres. This is, these are from a national database called TARM. Falls less than two metres are things like one flight of stairs or a step ladder. Nowadays, only uh, in recent times, uh, road traffic collisions have uh, almost halved in proportion and falls have increased almost 80-fold and are a major problem. I'll come to that in a bit. And these numbers, at the end of these numbers, there's a human being. These are, these are patients, these are people that have injuries, and this is one of our patients from last year. Um, this is the first morning after she's had a severe road traffic accident and she's with our uh, absolutely fantastic therapies team we, um, on the morning after she had the accident. We run something called hyperacute rehabilitation at Aintree which is where we get our patients assessed and get them moving and walking within 24 hours um, and that's shown to have quite significant uh, medium and long, well, long term outcomes on getting patients moving. Now this, this lady had significant skeletal fractures, you can see her ribs here and bent, snapped and bent in at least five or six places. And that's her sternum, that's her breastbone, spine there, sternum there, that's snapped there as well. So her entire chest skeleton had been caved in, yet she's up and about walking the next day. The accident that caused her to be in this state was preventable. So what are the objectives of this group, this Trauma Prevention Foundation that's being formed? Well, essentially it's to reduce the incidence and the mortality from major trauma in Liverpool and Merseyside. That's a model of care if it's successful, we'll roll it out nationally. We're going to work as a trauma observatory to look at data um, from, from Mark's group at the Public Health Institute, from our own data in the Major Trauma Centre in Liverpool, and also real-time human intelligence data from people like myself on on the, on, on, on the shop floor at ground, at ground level. We intend, intend then to use data to intelligently educate and to empower the general public with decisions about why they're having their traumas. How are we going to do this? We're going to identify and analyse patterns and trends in major trauma. We, we, the aim is to make dashboards providing a real-time trauma data on how things are going on, identify emergence of new patterns of injury uh, and monitoring the existing known patterns of trauma and then communicate these findings to the relevant agencies to inform trauma prevention strategies. Our three main domains that we initially are focusing on will probably be our main themes going onwards will be uh, knife-related trauma, falls and road traffic collisions. So what is the structure of this thing I'm talking about, the Trauma Prevention Foundation? So essentially it's a triumvirate of clinicians, myself uh, from the Major Trauma Centre and from our University Hospital of the Royal, uh, the, the data analyst and, and the data scientist, Mark and his team, at, at, uh, and Jenny at uh, <coughs> John Moyes University, and also lo local authorities. We have very strong links to Merseyside Police and, and uh, the City Council now as well. And these are the people who started this whole thing off. Myself, uh, Rob Jackson, is a nurse clinician at the Royal University Hospital, Liverpool. 
Uh, Rob, some of you may know, he's had 10 years' worth of experience with knife crime prevention talks in local schools, an absolute hero both locally and nationally. He's got over a 1,000 students talk per month um, in knife crime prevention. Uh, Jenny and Mark are the, uh, the data gurus from John Moores University, and Mike McFall, only recently retired inspector with the uh, Rhodes Police and Emergency Night Police. So that was the core group that started this whole thing off. We're very fortunate to have some very high level support and uh, Professor Denise Barra-Baxendale, who's the current boss of Everton Football Club, um, is one of our trustees for the group and we meet on a regular basis. She gives us idea, resource and pushes us forward and uh, she's absolutely amazing. And I said that through gritted teeth because I'm a Liverpool fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chief Constable Andy Cook is the top policeman in the city. Again, we meet him at least once a year and, and Mark and Jenny and I throw the data at him, the ideas at him and have his full support on how we're going to push up trauma prevention agenda. I mean, we're only about 18 months old, the, the group, and we're evolving as every single month goes on. So how are we going to do what we want to do? What, what's the plan? We need some data. We can't just be talking and saying, put your knives down, drive safely. We need to have some data to provide an intelligent uh, opinion, um, which we want to actually stick into the heads of pretty much everyone in the city, the front row lobes, give them that idea, uh, a data-driven message that puts into their to their brains, what the behavioural psychologists call it, or heuristic, something they can draw from when a, a, a situation evolves. Now, Liverpool is a very busy, very loud city, and we've got to get this message absolutely everywhere, and that is our crusade. And we've already made some very strong links to, to try and get onto that. We've heard a lot about in the UK about the public health approach to reducing violence. This is topical in London at the moment with knife crime. This is something that we have been looking into in terms of an approach ourselves. And, I quite like the idea of working at a population level and at inception that's what we wanted to do rather than a target group. And so defining the individual problem, uh, identifying the risk and the protective factors, developing prevention strategies and then moving on with them, ensuring widespread adoption of those um, strategies is the essential framework for how we want to act. So some examples of, of, of those domains that I talked about before. So the road traffic collisions, uh, we actually did an academic study looking at all the deaths from road traffic accidents um, around uh, Liverpool and Merseyside. We've got the police reports, we looked at all the data, and we teased out some common factors of what pe why people are dying on our roads. So I'll show some of these graphs later to show you. It was initially done as an academic exercise, but based from this, we, we teased out the preventable aspects of it. It was done by Neville, Neville Spiteri, who's one of our, um, came over to Liverpool to learn trauma surgery on the rest of Malta. He's gone back to Malta, and he did this lovely <coughs> thing. And what it showed was that the, 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 the greater, there's a great proportion, a significant proportion, about 35 to 40% of what we call human factors um, involved in, in people dying on the roads, essentially. So judgment error, dangerous vehicle movement, over speeding, mm -hmm. as opposed to the traditional thoughts of, well, if you ask lay members, if you ask anyone really, you know, why are people dying on our roads? And people say, oh, it's because it's wet, it's icy. There's only a low, low proportion of that. And interestingly, only alcohol and drugs are only 12.5%. And the vast majority, as I said, no, sorry, not the vast majority, the majority was our human factors. And there's something in there that we can tease out, analyze, and give a message about. Mark and his team produce these lovely geographical maps of all the hot spots around the city where these, these road traffic accidents and the fatalities are occurring. And this will help. Um, uh, uh, we can provide this data, they've provided this data to, to local authorities and to, to for resource focusing. This year's focus in Liverpool is all about knife related, knife related trauma. It's just described as an academic, and this was the newspaper in Liverpool from two or three days ago. And as I said, from my perspective as a trauma surgeon, it is an epidemic, it's a massive problem. And we've got some data to back that up. And although you, you hear about these explosive headlines and everything in the news, that is. That is true. It's not so much as an epidemic, but a steady rise that's been documented over the years. This is, this is uh, work from, again, Mark and his team at the Trauma, uh, the, um, trauma Intelligence um, Group. Uh, this is emergency department uh, admissions going at a steeper rate um, in Liverpool. And, and, and the rate of increase both to the ambulances and to the emergency department is going on. Um, the, the team have produced some absolutely gorgeous very clever geospatial maps looking at where our knife crime incidents are occurring in the city. And these are the health related incidents. These are the patients who are occurring penetrating traumas requiring an ambulance, not just walking in off the streets or where they're stopped and searched. And there's three areas that were identified in Liverpool. So there's the nighttime economy, there's the North Liverpool, which is around our hospital area, the sort of 
what we could what we say in Liverpool, a dodgy area, and South Liverpool speak, which was surprising to me and a few of our team as well. But it's interesting, we've given that data to, to the police to see if they can cross-reference it with their data, and this is very much what we're going to be thinking about, well, not thinking about, going to focus our resource, our, our, our um, community teaching, our going into schools, um, um, going onwards. Uh, uh, incidentally, we're also starting a project this summer, which we're going to go live called Knife Savers, which is a citywide hemorrhage control, uh, bleeding control education package around the city. We're going to teach everyone in the city how to stop bleeding from knives. We'll be putting bleeding control packs around the city, starting there, moving out to there, moving out to there. And again, this is the human element. This is the human aspect. At the end of all of these numbers, there's a human being, there's a person. And this is, this is what happens with a knife, essentially. If the blade doesn't penetrate and cause a mortality, these are life-changing injuries. And this is one of my patients from last week. All of these patients have consented for their images to be used in this presentation. This is a single stab wound to a patient's mind from last year. So this is a CT scan, slices through the human body. Um, that's what a kidney should look like. We've got a single stab wound there, and that's penetrated the kidney just there. And this individual patient has, had, has hemorrhaged um, litres around the kidney. Uh, we managed to stop him bleeding. Um, if there is a, uh, there's a, a sort of a covering, covering the uh, kidney in place there, if that would have been breached there, all that blood would have flown into his abdomen and he would have, he would have died, but he didn't. Um, and we've got quite a lot of national exposure. We, are, we were at the media came and saw our work last year on ITN News. Allegra Stratton, who's the na national news editor, is very much um, supporting us, and then Mark, and I'm looking incredibly intelligent now. So, <laughs> no glasses there. <laughs> and Jenny as well. So um, we've, we've already created these media networks where once our message is given, there what we what we can uh, we can tap these. Up. Falls Park, the third domain of what we're doing, is the one that we're actually going live with very very soon. Um, and everyone thinks, and this, I, I say this to people, and they say, "You're a trauma surgeon. Why are you focusing on, on, on knives? It's not sorry, on falls. It's not guns and knives." Well, no, actually, because in our trauma centre, if you look at all the data, falls accounts for almost 50 to 60 percent of admissions from major traumatic injuries. And this is the frightening figure. In 2016, almost 80 percent of all the deaths, people dying in our trauma centre, due to falls. And falls is quite an all-encompassing term. But what I mean by falls is down a flight of stairs, off a brick wall, or from the top of a bridge. It is literally falling. It's broken down by in, in the national trauma data set into um, falls less than two meters or above two meters. But we conducted a study of all the deaths in our trauma center from people falling. And what we, what we saw was quite a frightening <coughs> figure, a case fatality rate of 9.1% from, from falls less than two meters. That's a flight of stairs. That's a step ladder. Now you cross-reference that with the case fatality rate of being run over or being involved in a road traffic accident. And what that shows is that the risk of dying with major... If you come to our trauma centre with major traumatic injuries, having fallen down a flight of stairs, your risk of dying is almost twice as that if you've been run over. And that's the information we want to get out there. That, you know, I'm not saying be terrified of your stairs, but, you know, be terrified of your stairs. <laughs> <laughs> um, causes of falls are major. We, we actually did then went on to do um, over a year-long study looking at why our patients are forming and we, we employed our therapies team, a fantastic study of over 100 patients and what we worked out was about 35% of all the patients who are falling have a preventable, uh, potentially preventable cause for their falls. So I'm not talking about things like medications or intrinsic cardiac rhythms or anything like that, but there are three main themes that came out of that study. First of all, alcohol. And it was involved in 50%, especially in the, in the demographic of 50 to 70, the age group is 50 to 79. 50% of those patients had had a few beers or what were initially on their first day in the hospital was described as a glass of wine and towards the end of the stay in the hospital was described as a bottle and a half of wine. <laughs> um, and then it's that lack of, lack of perception of the dangers of their stairs as it were and they felt and they incurred some very severe injuries. Lighting is, an, it is also an issue as well. What we found out was a lot of our patients are telling us that when um, 20% of the cases it was a preventable factor that this is their house, they know their house, why do they have to put the lights on at night when they go into the bathroom? And this is why, because they could fall, there's a, there's a degree of disorientation for whatever reason, um, and a number of these patients are falling and incurring potentially life-threatening injuries. So one of the messages that we wanted to give from this was to, 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 to keep your lights on, even at, 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 at a dim level. Um, I have two toddlers at home, so we have these little blue lights on everywhere. 
Um, and that's one of the things that we were, were working on with our trauma, uh, with the message that we give to the authorities, which is a little bit of low level lighting can make all the, all the difference. And finally, footwear, that's something else we teased out as well, which is the fact that ill fitted <coughs> footwear, slippers, backless slippers, or, or, or slipping surfaces, old, old slippers, were actually responsible for quite a lot, or a factor in quite a lot of falls in the 50 to 69 age grade age group as well. And these three, um, what we think is preventable factors we've actually um, put into a data set uh, and a fact package that we've given to Everton Football Club who are very much um, supporting us and, and Everton in the communities there, the community charitable wing, we've met with them on multiple occasions over the last two years, Mark and myself and, and, and a lot of the team and it's now the ball is in their court, they're working on a, a, a media uh, campaign uh, to, to inform everyone in the city about the dangers of falls, especially if you're into the stairs. So, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, um, what I've presented is, is, is a model of collaborative working with the Trauma Prevention Foundation. Uh, we, we want to try to employ a public health approach to trauma prevention. Um, we've got evolving networks that are growing by the month of people wanting to help us, wanting to join us, which is amazing. Um, and this can only help with, with spreading our messaging and uh, getting that message out there. But the message is very much based on you know, unintelligent data. Thank you. Um, it's the length of the School of Art and Design. Uh, I work with your colleague Paul Romano. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering, are you considering engaging the arts in getting messages out there, and getting that data across, if you like? And, and, and any way we can, absolutely. Any way that we can um, to help. So yes is the short answer. Yeah. What we worked out, so initially the, the, the model to actually get the message out there was to approach the football groups, Everton and Liverpool, because what we thought was the demographic of people are getting stabbed, carrying blades and driving crazily are, uh, I was going to initially say young men, but our data actually shows us it's males up to the age of 40. So there's a 40 year old man young, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, I say yes. I say yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, um, so we've initially approached the football clubs, but uh, as time has gone on, we've got more offers from that, from areas that we didn't think would help us, but definitely, uh, yeah, we'll be very keen to engage the arts. We haven't done that as yet, but massively open to offers. Yeah, you had a question as well. Oh, yeah. Um, the, uh, sorry, Zenia from the Public Health Can you Team. Speak? Yeah, yeah, sorry, Zenia Kumi, Public Health Team in the City of London. Um, the, the falls from a low height, does that, um, the fatalities, does that include suicides, the, the data? Um, no, that, that's a very good question, but there is the short answer because the suicides have actually gone into a separate category okay. as well. Um, it, does, it does into the entire falls category, so that's the yeah, exactly you teased that. He's had a good point there. So when we rolled it back to 80% 80 of the patients, 80% of all the deaths in our trauma centre due to falls, yes, yeah, a proportion of those are due to suicides. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? No, there was one oh, more sorry, question. Yeah, no. Sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, it's often physical trauma heals, doesn't it? But what about the psychological yeah, trauma and yeah. um, post-traumatic stress yeah, disorder? Really Is there any aftercare that you refer patients yeah. to? So that's in its infancy in Liverpool, but that's something we're studying this year. We actually presented something on that about two years ago at one of the European trauma meetings. And, and so there's a big paper come out this year from, from the American centres that have said it's up to 65, 65% of patients who have major trauma of all sorts, not necessarily due to violence, um, such you know, just a knife or whatever, but any sort of major trauma have, um, have actually diagnosed as either having depression or symptoms of depression which is transient, up to 35% of, of established PTSD. So we're starting something specifically looking at our knife crime work to actually tease that out. So it's only becoming an evolve, it's only an evolving um, thing that we're only just realising in the trauma community nationally. There are things around, places to be signposted to, but they're only in their very early stages and they need to be better. So we've got a clinical psychologist at Aintree, but you know, it's um, certainly one of her and I'm referring patients to about 10 a week. So um, watch this space. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Cheers, thank, thank you very much. much.